I was a kid like a lot of a lot of American kids we were we were inundated with the British influence Led Zeppelin's the Jeff Beck groups the you know uh, Eric Clapton's and stuff like that and, and it was a band called Fleetwood Mac and I remember my dad liking a version of the Fleetwood Mac that had Peter Green in it and my mom uh, liking a version of the Fleetwood Mac that um, had Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks in it but like you know a lot of us the first time you ever heard Peter Green <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but, but you know, and, you know, that band would even, you know, like with, with Peter and Jeremy Spencer, and it, it, what you heard was these guitar sounds that were not being created in America at the time, you know what I mean? It was like the late 60s, and it was, it was partly the gear, it was partly this kind of movement of, of the blues in the UK that, 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 um, that really influenced more Americans, I think, at the time than 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 you know than than anybody because it was it was it was this kind of exotic form of the blues dressed as rock and roll, and so you know and then as I went down the rabbit hole, Peter Green, you know, you know, I mean, you know, I need your love so bad. It's just it's it, like BB King called it one of the the great blues songs of all time, you know, and. You know, just his feel and his touch, you know. He kind of was like, you know, he played all the T-Bone stuff, but he also could rock. I mean, when you listen to John May on the Blues Breakers, the Hard Road record, I mean, that's as fiery and as incendiary guitar playing as you'll ever find. And, you know, if you didn't know, you would think it was Clapton. It was the second record with Clapton, but it's not. It was him. It was mm -hmm. Peter Green. And, you know, it was the sound of a Les Paul through a cranked blues breaker, Marshall combo, or some sort of British amplification device. Could have been a Vox, could have been. But, you know, in those footage, you see Peter, he's playing Showman's. So it was a Fender thing. And But, you know, a lot of times for me, I enjoyed um, just listening to that, that journey that those guys would, would, would make, especially in Fleetwood Mac. You know what I mean? It's like, a, it's a real... It's a real, um, it's a real eye opener, and and, uh, and you know he's he's so young when he died, and, and such a talent, you know. Yeah. So to be holding his guitar is like a real real treat for me today. Well, moving on to the guitar, on your, on your lap you've got a 1968 Gretsch yeah. White Falcon that belonged to uh, Peter. What's your as a guitar collector? What's your sort of estimation of the of the guitar? It needs a set of strings, but <laughs> that, that's the easy part. Oh, it's a beautiful guitar, you know. The the White Falcon was the the it was the highest end model that Gretsch made with the highest end appointments and you know every guitar company Fred Gretsch included um, they always they had the they had the one for the for the rich dad who wanted it all you know and this was it this was this was the most you know decked out appointments you got two mutes not one um, you got kill switches everywhere it's hard to figure out how to get these things going. We got the Filtertrons, which is cool. This is good. Those are the best pickups for these. And it's a double cut. And, you know, Gretsch's have a certain sound. And they're kind of indelibly linked to the Bigsby, you know, because... I'm trying to keep it in tune. But, um, you know, the Roller Bridge. It's a beautiful example, and if you had one of those cowboy belt buckles, they had you covered, you know. Um, gold everywhere, you know. I remember first seeing one of these, I think Stephen Stills had one. Mm. And I think uh, Stephen Stills had a double cut or a single cut. Neil Young had a yeah. single cut, but it was his was stereo, so mm. half it, it was like half the it was crazy stuff that they made. And, you know, befriending Randy Bachman, um, for years and years and years ago, you know, Randy has or had um, until he sold it. I believe he sold it to Gretsch itself. Um, he had one of the most definitive, completest Gretsch collection in the world. And you know, it's just to think about like all of the 
iconic brands that came out of America in the 50s and 60s. You know, I mean, Crutch was around long before that, but the, the, the design, you know, they're still making guitars that, that are derivative of this today. Mm -hmm. We're talking about 65, 70 years later, you know, and, you know, this guitar is almost 60 years old and, and it's still just as cool as it was in 1968. And that's that you know that's a classic design. I could see why Peter wanted one, you know, because you know. You, do, you, do you think it's a slightly unusual guitar for a blues player? Uh, you can play blues on anything, you know. Sun yeah. Seals play blues on a guild, you know. Muddy Waters play blues on a guild. Um, Bobby Parker, um, the the legendary blues guy um, who since passed away. Um, he was the one that recorded the version of Steal Your Heart Away, which uh, I believe the New Yardbirds covered and was suggested to me that I cover. Bobby Park was from Baltimore, and he was this stone-cold blues man. And he showed up with a dime bag Daryl Explorer by Dean with the headstock modified, and he ripped into the blues, and he didn't care. And that was, that's the cool thing about the blues. You can play it on anything, you know? <laughs> And that's why I love the fact that, you know, like Kirk Hammett has, has the Les Paul. He's playing his music on that guitar, you know, and it, it's, it's that the Les Paul shouldn't just be a blues guitar, you know, this Gretsch shouldn't just be a rockabilly guitar. It, you can play anything, you know, on, on any, any guitar, you know, it's, as long as it works and it's loud. <laughs> sort of traditional blues territory now. So yeah. 1931 National Joelian. What's your take on that, the condition, etc.? Particularly good one. Um, not a lot of these survived with neck angles that are playable, you know. Mm. We were talking earlier off camera about the fact that these didn't come originally with, with truss rods. So if the thing sat for 80 years with tension on it, like the neck would bow and and a lot of times you have to do some pretty invasive maintenance to get these to play. And of, and of course you, you got to do it because it's either you have two choices, hang it on the wall and look at it, or, or make music on it. I'd rather maintain it. Um, but this one is a particularly good sounding one. Um, the resonator's in really good shape. Sometimes these things develop rattles over the... I mean, we're talking about a guitar that's, let's round up, almost 100 years old. And... They, they develop kind of kind of rattly, non-musical things happening. This one's really stable, you know? And it projects nicely. And that's basically what it was, was is, is something that was a guitar amplifier built in, you know, in, into a, a, you know, a metal guitar. And it's such a genius design to make them out of steel and put a resonator on them. Actually, put a lot of work into this, and um, these would come in. This is a Duolian, and some of these were fancier than others. This is pretty, pretty basic one, um, but it's Peter's, and it's on the cover of that album, and and you could tell he loved it, and. Uh, 
and it's definitely a, a, a blues guitar. Um, but you, like I said, you can play anything on it. I, I, I watched Chris Whitley one time, literally by himself, with one of these, and a, a pickup tape to the front of it, a wire down to the floor, a phone book with a, with a kick drum sample on it, blow my entire three-piece band off the stage at the patio in Indianapolis. And it was the most incredible, intense thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And Chris used to play one of these. Mm -hmm. And it was not blues. It was very, very progressive and modern. And, and it was just him by himself. And it was just the most insane thing I've ever seen in my entire life. So, so, so the lesson is, is no matter what the tool is, is you can always do something different with it, and uh, yeah, this is this is really good. This is a real thrill to see this. I I, I recognize this from many photos that uh, I've I've seen Peter with this one. So. Do you have any nationals in your collection? Um, yes, uh, I may have a half a dozen uh, nationals of different kinds. I got Dobros, I got I got wooden ones, I got steel ones, I got tricones. Um, you know my my. My favorite is um, I have a I have a 1929 or 30. Figure out the date. It's a it's a national you know style three, a tricone. It's pretty engraved and it's and it's nice. Um, I used it on Mark Broussard's record, and they're they're really cool. Um, we actually put a microphone in the in the F hole, taped it in there, kind of like it's taped to my lapel, and uh, ran it through an old amp, and got this really cool very lo-fi bluesy sound out of it and uh yeah so they're 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 great when they work there's nothing like them they're totally a unique design mm. pre and post well we were, we were saying earlier again off camera that uh, it was a genius idea to tempt banjo players into actually playing guitar and uh, don't you find that's an incredibly loud one i've, I've heard I've heard a few in the past, and for the body size and everything, that's really kicking out some volume. It, it has good volume. Yeah, it, it, and it's dynamic too, because it... I mean, you can, you can finger pick it, and my hands are all beat up, but anyway, um, it's, it's a particularly good one. I, I could see why he would want it. Because um, you could line ten of these up in a row and be like, "This one's not good. This one's not good. This would this would stand out in anybody's, you know, in anybody's mind as being the reason why he bought it in the first place." Mm. And finally, the um, the rest of the collection that Bonhams have, have got is a really eclectic um, group of guitars. Peter seemed to buy anything just because he liked. Mm -hmm. For instance, they say that he he would buy something just because he liked the color mm -hmm. and everything. Right. Um, how He's not unique that? in that, by the way. People, us collectors, do that, you know. So, how do you think that fits into Peter's sort of personality as a player? Well, I mean, I read a story, or I, I watched an interview with somebody. It was, it was, it was, it was somebody associated with Fleetwood Mac, and when when Peter left the band, he said, "Well, you." We should name the band Fleetwood Mac for the drummer and the bass player because mm. when the band breaks up, they're going to need something to fall back on. If that is not eclectic thinking, and you know, I mean, he was like that. I mean, he was so consistent his whole life, you know, about how he just did things. He 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 was a unique individual and 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 could always surprise you, you know. I mean, like just that output from like 1967 to like 1970. I mean, it just. We're still, again, we're still talking about it today. You know, it's like such a such a such a great such a great band, and then to have them pivot to make one of the best selling. I mean, Rumors is one of the best selling records of all time, and you know. But if you still think about it, you know, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. It's a shuffle. Mm -hmm. It's a shuffle, a great shuffle. You know, Mick Fleetwood's a great blues drummer. You know, so. There you go. And here we are with Peter Green's guitar.
Thank you.